I'd like to thank sponsors Music Master, Target Spot, and Abacast. And I'd like to introduce uh, our next presentation. Um, our next presenter will feature new data from the Infinite Dial study sponsored by Triton Digital and Edison Research. How has music curation changed and how does that impact your audience? Here to present new unreleased data on song sharing behaviors from Edison Research, Tom Webster. Good morning. Um, I am going to present some new data today, I promise you, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about eyeglasses, dresses, Nutella, and the most embarrassing record in my record collection. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about curation and how to spread your brand and how to spread uh, your services amongst a larger and broader audience. And we have a little bit of data to, to speak about that. First question I have for you, though, uh, how many of you are in the business of content? Just about everybody, right? Just about all of you are in the business of content. Um, there's kind of a 2011-ish paradigm about content, which I'm going to disabuse a little bit, but I'm going to show you how a rough way to organize content on the web. There's three kinds of people related to content on the web, at least back in 2011 thinking. You have consumers. You have people that are consuming the content. You have curators. These are the people that are sharing the content and, and telling other people about it. Uh, then you have creators, and these are the people that are actually making the content. And there's some kind of received wisdom about this, that 1% of people are creators, 19% are curators, and, and the rest are just gone in a blue screen of death. <laughs> now, the way that we think about curation and the way that we think about sharing, I'm going to challenge that a little bit. First question I have for you, though, in lieu of actual slides, how many of you have ever shared a song online? How many of you have ever shared a song online? Wow, a lot of you, right? Most, uh, looks like most of you in this room. Now you are, of course, in this business. I get that. Um, I have shared music online a lot. And if you followed me on Twitter, if you followed me on Facebook, I'm always sharing songs or stations or playlists. I'm going to share with you the very first album I ever bought. The very first album I ever bought was this one. Mm -hmm. You are a formidable man, Tom, you might say, for sharing that. But that was the first album I ever bought. In fact, I have, I have shared that online before. And a lot of you in this room have shared things before. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about today is some research that we did with Edison Research and Triton Digital in the Infinite Dial. And this is research that we did not share on the Infinite Dial webcast. And that is a little bit about people who share songs online. So just to recap a little bit, uh, how many of you listened to the webcast or at least downloaded the Infinite Dial Report? So m a good number of you. Uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on the methodology. It's a random digit dial methodology. Everybody in the United States has an equal non-zero chance of being selected, and that's why it is projectable. And just one thing to add on to the bottom of that, I'm going to show you the next graph is amongst social media users, social networking users. And just, I just want to point out here that that's two-thirds of the country. That 67% of Americans 12 plus have a profile on at least one social network. And certainly that's Facebook and a whole bunch of others. Uh, of the 33% who do not, a little less than half don't even have internet access. So social media is nearly ubiquitous in this country. We asked people who had a profile on one or more social media, social networking services, have you ever shared music online on these services? Have you ever shared a song? Have you ever shared a station or a playlist? And 35% of these people said, yes, we have. We have shared a song online. Now, many of you in this room work for services, stations, pure plays, whatever, that provide the grist for their mill. These are some of your favorite people. These are the people that are spreading the news about your service, spreading the news about your station, spreading the news about whatever music offering you have, right? Now, I will post these uh, a little bit later online so you can get them. The thing I want to point out about the demographics here, yes, about half of them are 18 to 34, those bottom two slices there, uh, but a little over half of them are not. And in fact, what I would point out about the demographics of song sharers is they're not dramatically different from the demographics of social media users, period. Social media tends to lean a little bit more female, a little young, but this doesn't look dramatically different. In other words, this is sort of straight up social media users in this country who engage in song sharing behaviors. They also happen to be very, very good customers of the types of services that many of you may represent. 
I won't dwell too much on the names here. I'll only point out that percentage of song sharers who listen to these services within the last month, these numbers are all about 50 to 100 percent higher than the general population of internet radio listeners. So they're consuming a lot of these services. But what's more important here is they have this dramatic habit, the social habit. On the left, 28% of Americans 12 plus check social media and check social networks multiple times per day. That's easy to do with a phone. I'm always pulling my phone out and checking it. 28% of Americans 12 plus. With song sharers, people who have this bug, this gene, to share what they're doing and what they're listening to and what they're consuming online. 61% of them consulting their social sites and services multiple times a day. That's addict behavior. There aren't many things that you do multiple times per day besides eat and pee and for me nap, right? There's a lot of addictive behavior going on with these people. They're always at the ready. They're always able to share their content and certainly the smartphone has a great deal to do with that. Now, they're active across multiple platforms. I want to point out here on this graph, yes, Facebook is significant here. 95% of song sharers have a Facebook account. Uh, but if you look at all of the other platforms here that have significant reach, significant double-digit reach, things like Instagram, Google+, Twitter, Pinterest, Snapchat. And again, if you look at this demographically, you'll see, you'll see things like Instagram and Snapchat rise right up to be number two and three in the younger demographics. A couple things about this. Number one, they're using multiple platforms. These numbers don't add up to 100, right? They add up to, I'm crap at numbers, 435 or something. They're using multiple platforms. A platform strategy is not a strategy. The strategy you need to have is a behavior strategy. How do we encourage and reward the behavior here to share our content on all of these platforms? Second thing I will point out, a few years ago when that initial paradigm I talked to you about, about consumer curators and creators was introduced, things like Instagram, Snapchat, Vine didn't really exist, right? It is now so easy to create content if we expand our definition of what creating content means. We're all creating content. Anytime somebody goes out and takes a picture of their dinner at a restaurant or a selfie while they're out on the town, they are creating content. It's not just 1% anymore. It's far greater than 1%. Same with curating or sharing at least. Sharing is enormously easy to do, much easier to do now than it was three or four years ago. Almost any piece of content you see on the web is lousy with sharing tools. Multiple ways to share them to all of these particular platforms. Uh, and the final thing I'll point out about song sharers and why they're so valuable to you. The average Facebook user in this country has 350 friends or approximately 10 times more than they actually have in real life. Song shares have 524 friends. Some of us are freaks. I have 10,000 Twitter followers. I have no idea why. But there are song sharers that engage in these behaviors, that engage in sharing behaviors, also tend to attract a lot more people. So they are little tent poles for your audience in a way. They're valuable to reach because they are reaching more people than normal. They are the gateway to even larger groups of audience of consumers, right? Now, sharing these days is very, very easy to do. I'm sure that, how many of you have sharing tools baked into your service somehow? Sharing, we're rife with sharing tools, right? It's so easy to share content. It is so easy to share content, in fact, that there is almost no bar to sharing content. And when there is almost no bar to sharing content, we get a lot of stuff like this. Your Facebook feed probably looks like this on a day-to-day -day basis. Lots of stuff from BuzzFeed. 17 ways to eat more Nutella. I only needed one. Stuff like Viral Nova. What happened next is unbelievable. They're stealing from your page, writing broadcast news headlines and teases to get people to consume content. Because there are so many ways to share content, everybody is sharing content. And so much of this content is, to use a technical term, crap. Right? There's a low bar to share it. A lot of stuff's getting shared. And if you look at your Facebook feed on a day-to-day -day basis, you probably see a lot of this stuff, right? It's not enough to provide sharing tools if we want people to tell our story. It's not enough to give people a pen and a piece of paper and expect them to write our novel for us. We have to go beyond the tools. Because there is so much of this content out there, and it's so ephemeral, there's so much of it. It's being shared by everybody. Your 
content is trapped in this mix with BuzzFeed and Viral Nova, all this stuff being shared, like one big celestial content jukebox. And I share that metaphor very consciously. We don't care about jukeboxes. What we want is something to care about. And that's why we need to think less about sharing and more about what I think curation really is. Curation, if you think about a museum, uh, the curator of a museum, the curator of a museum is not someone who just simply shares paintings with you, right? They, don't walk in, they, they didn't walk into some giant Facebook art gallery and like 40 paintings so they show up in your feed. That's not what they do. They carefully and artfully construct a story. Every room in a well-curated museum is a story. Every piece has a provenance that the curator knows. Every piece is sequenced and positioned in a way to tell the story that the curator wants to tell. And that is why you care about it, right? These paintings that are above the exit of this gallery, they're like the buzzfeed of this gallery. Unless there is a curator there who tells you why they're above the exit, why you should pause for a moment and think about who these two people are and this uh, factory that is positioned above the door, why is it there? When there is a curator who tells you why that painting is there and what it means, you care a little bit. You don't just sort of blow out the door, right? Sharing is easy, in other words. Song sharing is table stakes. The tools you have that enable people to share content online, that's table stakes. Curation is something else. And that's really what I want to talk about here in, in the closing minutes here. I mentioned that the first album I ever bought was the soundtrack to Xanadu, which is arguably the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. But at the time when I saw it, uh, I was a boy. And why do you think I bought this album? Yes, Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> that golden-haired, dewy-eyed dove who roller skated her way into this young boy's heart. I was deeply in love with Olivia Newton-John at that age. My tastes in music and women have changed since then. Um, but that's why I bought that album. I didn't know anything about music. I bought the soundtrack to Xanadu because I had a big old honking crush on Olivia Newton-John. And I got that record home and I played it over and over and over. And if you, if you owned that vinyl, there was an ONJ side and an ELO side. Pink and blue labels. Cute, right? Side one was the Olivia Newton-John song. Side two were the Electric Light Orchestra songs. Eventually, I turned the record over and listened to the Electric Light Orchestra side, and I discovered that I really liked that music. That turned me on to that kind of music in a way that I never had been before. And I began to explore, and I began to find other, uh, other bands that sounded like that, other sounds that intrigued me. And I, I went through this whole progressive rock phase as a teenager, right? Listening to, uh, listening to Electric Light Orchestra led me to the Moody Blues, and then I guess that Mellotron infected my head. It led me to King Crimson. It led me then to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and eventually to, to Yes. I've seen Yes an embarrassing number of times live in concert. And I, I developed this love for prog rock at the time. When I was in college, I went to college uh, at Tufts in Boston. And I remember my sophomore year, Yes was playing at the Worcester Centrum, about an hour drive out. I was so excited to finally see Yes live in concert. I grew up in Maine. Nobody goes up to Maine except for, like, Hall and Oates, right? Um, so I was so excited, and I took my then-girlfriend, who became my uh, first wife. I took my then-girlfriend to this concert. I was so excited to see Yes. And I went. It was the big generator tour, so it wasn't Steve Howe. It was Trevor Rabin, but it was still good. And I, I loved this concert. I was enthralled by it, right? I, just, I, lo I ate it up. I was on my feet the whole time. My, uh, my then-girlfriend, not so much. In fact, she hated it. The, the, the ride home was like stony silence, right? I had done a bad thing. Now, we did eventually get married, and we eventually got divorced. And I pin, I trace all of that back to this. I trace it, the whole line that I should have known that someone who would ridicule my choice of, of, of concerts here was ultimately not the mate for me. And that's how Olivia Newton-John led to my divorce in a very different way than it may have for some other people. Now, what did I just do? I just told a story. That's what curation is. Curation is a very powerful thing if we can equip and empower and encourage our listeners to tell stories about the music they are sharing. It's going to make it matter. It's going to make them come to us and share those things with their friends, with their average of 524 Facebook friends, and perhaps even more. Now, I'm going to close with three quick tips 
If you do nothing else but think about these three things, and I will have been a success today. Three tips to think about to activate curation, which again, I have a higher bar for curation than I do sharing. The first thing is that we need to have better storytelling tools, not just sharing tools, but storytelling tools. We need to equip our listeners with ways that they can tell stories about the songs that they are listening to from our services. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Storify. Storify is a wonderful tool that lets you assemble bits of content from social, from YouTube, from Twitter, from the news, video, whatever, and tell your own story with it. It is such a powerful and easy to use storytelling tool that many journalists use it to provide an adjunct to articles that they write. It is now a, sort of a journalistic practice to use Storify. Uh, Tumblr is another great tool that allows you to build a story out of content. Pinterest is the same way with visual content. It's a way to articulate and assemble a story that people will find some context and some relevance with, right? And in fact, song sharers are three times more likely to use Tumblr than the general population. Now, but as I mentioned before, the tools are not enough, but we can give them better tools. We can provide them ways to tell the story of how the music affects them, of their big night, of the first concert they went to. Anything that gets them to share your service with a context attached. Second tip is to motivate the behavior. Actually motivate people to share the content, curate the content, and create a story around it. I'll give you two quick personal examples here. Uh, the first is uh, Diane von Furstenberg, DVF, had an Instagram contest where they wanted you to narrate your big night and you had to be wearing a DVF dress, right? So your big night had to be a part of it. You had to tell the story of your big night. My wife entered, my, my now wife, who were more musically compatible, thank God, entered this contest. She's an SVP of digital strategy uh, who entered an Instagram contest about, we won this contest with that picture on the left. She won like $1,000 worth of DVF dresses. She was spurred to tell the story of our big night. She was, this was our wedding night wearing a DVF dress. She was spurred to tell that story by this contest. Contesting is a great way to motivate the initial behavior. I was so uh, blown away by the fact that she won this that I entered an Instagram contest the very next week with Parker Pens. They wanted you to Instagram where you work and tell the story of your workplace. I snapped a shot of an airplane because that's where I work. And I won a $600 fountain pen. You cannot borrow it, right? This, these are two like senior executives and we were like, hell yeah, we did it. We were motivated to curate a story about the brands that were represented here, right? And in fact, the brand Parker was not even represented in their contest. It was more about the story. So there are ways to encourage. And the last tip I will give you is to reward the behavior in the wild. I share songs all the time. I share playlists all the time. I share stations all the time. All of your services. I use them all. I'm a paid subscriber to almost everything in this room. I guarantee it. I have never once been thanked by you for doing that. It's a very easy thing to catch me doing it in the wild, to catch me sharing a station, to catch me sharing a song from somebody. It is a super easy thing to say, hey, Tom, thanks for sharing that, right? Uh, this, this kind of behavior happens on Twitter all the time. Uh, my wife is a rabid supporter of Warby Parker glasses. She share, every time anybody on Twitter asks her, what glasses should I buy, she says, Warby Parker. Warby Parker sent me a monocle last week. They sent her a birthday present. They reward the behavior. You think we're going to keep doing that? You're darn right we're going to keep doing that. When you see it happen in the wild, you reward it. I say this because I want you to matter. I want you to equip your listeners with ways to tell stories so that you're not just a jukebox, so that sharing becomes curating, and that there's context for all the great content that you are providing that makes it meaningful, that makes people pay attention to the story. I say this because I love you. I honestly love you. Thank you very much.